The new book, Drugs as Weapons Against Us, tells the story of how undercover U.S. intelligence agents use drugs to target leftist leaders from SDS to the Black Panthers, Young Lords, and even the Occupy movement. It also tells how they particularly targeted leftist musicians, including John Lennon, Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, Tupac Shakur, to promote drugs while later murdering them as they started to sober up. And goes into details about how Agents Dost uh, uh, gave LSD to Mick Jagger, got Elvis involved. Just in a compelling story. The author is John L. Potish. He's also the author of the FBI War on Tupac Shakur and Black Leaders. Give Thanks us a. Thank you so much, Alan. You're very welcome. Talk about how you came upon this and, and how long you've been working on it. And sure. in essence, what I said in the introduction, give a, a little bit of a summary on that. Sure. Yeah, so I, I was working as a drug and alcohol counselor in Baltimore. Uh, around 1990 when uh, someone I was counseling said uh, his father was a Black Panther killed by the police. And at the time, I was writing more fiction and was uh, developing a book on the theme of drugs as weapons against us, but from a novel standpoint. And so I started researching the Black Panthers um, based on what he told me, and I found that the leading Panthers in the New York area were the Shakurs, and that then all of a sudden, about a year or two later, this Tupac Shakur rises up as this black rapper, uh, icon, superstar. And uh, his parents, his mother, Afeni Shakur, was a uh, one-time leader of the Harlem Black Panthers. And strange uh, police foul play started to come up around his life. So I started uh, writing more about him in particular and got away from the, the novel with the theme of Drugs as Weapons Against Us I uh, ended up turning that into the book, The FBI War on Tupac Shakur and Black Leaders, because his uh, lawyer, his New York trial lawyer, Michael Warren, gave me a long interview saying, I, I think that the uh, police are targeting Tupac like they targeted his Black Panther parents. Mm-hmm. And he gave me all, you know, uh, about a two-hour interview of why. And it was very hard to publish an article like that at the time because there was so much kind of uh, smearing of Tupac. And he actually uh, had developed a plan to pretend to be a gangster in order to appeal to gangs and politicize them. It was part of his Black Panther Extended Families plan that was working across the country. They were getting the Bloods and Crips in Los Angeles to call peace truces and turn on to activism. That was spreading throughout California, and then they and other activists, including uh, Tupac and Harry Belafonte and others, were getting those peace truces and turn on to activism to happen across the country to the point in New York the uh, Young Lords, the, the uh, Latino version of the Black Panthers, got the Latin Kings to, to stop drug dealing and turn on to activism. And so this was, you know, this got to be a major motive for U.S. intelligence to be concerned about Tupac because he was, he was getting so influential. Um, and so uh, that became the first book. But at the same time as I was writing that, I was uh, review, I was reading books on John Lennon, for example, as you mentioned, and I found that this, uh, li- this lawyer, this British lawyer named Fenton Bressler, I wrote in this book, Who Killed John Lennon? And he was also a crime reporter for the uh, London Daily Newspaper. Mm-hmm. After a seven-year investigation, he found that the CIA assassinated uh, John Lennon when he sobered up and was getting back into activism and, you know, coming out with his next two albums. And so, uh, you know, I just started exploring that more. Then I explored Jimi Hendrix's death and within the last few years, a roadie that worked with Jimi Hendrix said that uh, Jimi Hendrix's manager, who was former MI6, which is British CIA, admitted when he was drunk to having Hendrix killed. And so, and then, of course, um, with Kurt Cobain, you might have heard about the recent film that came out, Soaked in Bleach, which shows all the evidence that he was actually murdered and didn't commit suicide. And I uh, ended up researching Kurt Cobain also. So Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, wow, so many interesting things. In fact, um, I know about that movie. I, they actually use audio from my shows I did with Tom Grant. I saw that. Uh, I heard that in the movie, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, but I got to tell you, it, it's it's just, so try. I, I think if you try to explain to people how the government might have been involved in drugs mm-hmm. in their own way, for example, the CIA's, uh, CIA's use of drugs to target activists. I remember Frank Zappa telling me on one of my first interviews 
that the CIA was uh, giving out the LSD to hippies in, in San Francisco or, or I guess mm-hmm. the Bay Area back yeah. in the 60s, at the same time busting them at night. And, yeah. and and then 60 Minutes did something on this. Is this kind of what you're talking about? Is it this... is. It is, exactly. Because um, the, the CIA had an operation called MK Ultra that started uh, in the 50s, and it was a huge operation it had it started as artichoke and then bluebird and then came, became mk ultra and there was many sub operations under mk ultra and it ran at least until the early 1970s when richard helms had all the documents he could possibly find shredded um, but luckily uh, some of the documents about 30,000 of, of them were saved in the finance department or he didn't realize were in the finance department so some of those documents is 30,000 still came out and um, so that shows some of the evidence of it. And there was many more documents than just 30,000 documents because it was, it was very long-running. But that operation did use, was exploring drugs, to, the use of drugs as weapons. And, um, you know, it's known, it came out in New York Times and other places that they had psychedelic hit lists. They were going to try to dose Castro and Che Guevara and Nasser of Egypt and people like that to undermine their credibility. But there's a number of studies. They, they, they used acid and many other drugs on uh, Edgewood Arsenal soldiers and tested how it affected them, including tests 20 years later. And so tests 20 years later had a core of them saying, I still feel like I have long-lasting negative effects from LSD. Now, the CIA knew this from testing them on just more than the soldiers. They tested them on, on uh, prisoners and, and many other people. Mm-hmm. But um, they could tell, you know, they could tell that it had some negative effects. It, but it, it allowed them to manipulate people that used a lot of LSD. It, it hurt their, it hurt people that used LSDs, you know, in other ways in terms of their uh, competency. According to William S. Burroughs, says he thinks it hurts people's competency. But um, the key is that it hurt, it undermined the best abilities of these activists like the Students for Democratic Society and, and others that were fighting against the Vietnam War, were trying to stop the Vietnam War. And so by doing that, um, they, could, they could really let, make the anti-war protesters less effective. And, um, and, you know, so by targeting musicians now, now um, A.E. Hotchner was uh, Ernest Hemingway's longtime editor, and he came out with a book called Blown Away about the Rolling Stones. In that book, he says that in 1965, the assistant deputy uh, director of the CIA, Robert Lashbrook, was in London getting LSD into as many musicians' hands as possible. You know, he had agents trying to get musicians in London to use LSD. Okay, and so why was he doing that? And why did Hotchner also interview an agent that was part of that you know, find find that out. And as you said, Mick Jagger's first hit of LSD came from an undercover FBI agent that came out in London Daily Newspapers. The reason is, I argue, is because they were using them as role models, just like getting LeBron James to wear Nike to get you know kids to wear Nikes. You know, that would turn that would make acid more popular. Now, when Brian Jones, you know, and they did that with Brian Jones, I argue. Mm. But when Brian Jones started sobering up, then they they watched him more closely on what was he was going to do next. Now, um, they also got, they also framed Mick Jagger right after giving him his first set of acid. So they got him under their legal thumbs, and they did the same with Jones, and they refused Jones a passport and a visa to come out of, uh, to come out of Britain to tour in, when the 1960, you know, Rolling Stones tour in America. So he, so Jones had to, it was disconnected from the Stones at that point. Jones was the founder of the uh, Rolling Stones, the best musician. He was good friends with Jimi Hendrix and John Lennon. He called Jimi Hendrix and John Lennon and asked them if they wanted to form a supergroup at that time, and they said yes, according to Hotchner. And uh, Hotchner um, quotes a member of the Guinness family who was close friends with Brian Jones, who said that at one day uh, uh, Jones sent me to, the, to town to pick up a friend to bring back to his house. He tries to come back to his house, and all of a sudden there's a party at his house. He didn't know why. There wasn't supposed to be a party. He couldn't get into the driveway. And he goes around the back, and he's looking at the swimming pool, and he sees a group of people drowning a man in the swimming pool, in Brian Jones' swimming pool. And it turns out that was Brian Jones, but somebody pops out of the bushes and says, you know, uh, you better get out of here and not say anything, or you'll be next. And he identifies the Guinness family members by name. And um, that guy was scared to death, but that was Brian Jones. He was drowned in his own swimming pool, despite wow. them saying he accidentally drowned in his own swimming pool. Did the other members of the Stones know it was a, something t- tied to the CIA? I mean, did they know? Well, 
Yeah, Keith Richards' quote was, he says, we couldn't get to the bottom of it. He says, Brian was an excellent swimmer. He's seen him you know, swimming in waves, up breakers up to here, you know. And uh, so it's like the JFK situation. You can't get to the bottom of it. It's all muddled, and we can't, we can't get any information on it. And so they knew something was up. They didn't know exactly what. But uh, then murder contracts came out for Mick Jagger, according to a Hells Angel who testified in court under the Witness Protection Program. He said there was... Uh, there, there was murder contracts when the other Hell's Angels was trying to kill Jagger, and this was the Oakland Hell's Angels, who an ATF agent had testified in court, saying that we got we gave um, murder contracts to the Oakland Hell's Angels to kill Cesar Chavez and Eldridge Cleaver, you know, the Minister of Information for the Black Panthers nationally. So um, this is some of the stuff that was going on. That when they tried to sober up, when they stopped promoting drugs, or when they got more into activism, because Jones and Jagger were the most. Uh, uh, you know, voiced voice the most opposition, opposition to the Vietnam War. They had also attended some anti-war rallies, and that was a huge concern, of course, for U.S. intelligence and British intelligence. So, And Hendricks, in the last year of his life, had gotten very politically active uh, against the Vietnam War. He had planned to call Bob Dylan to get him active with him. And um, according to you know, uh, Hendricks' uh, fiancée, Monica Danneman, and... Uh, his manager, Mike Jeffries, was, as I say, former MI6, but everyone knows that that's the British CIA. Everyone knows that CIA is a lifetime. You know, you don't just leave and you're never part of it again. It's the same with MI6, they say. And uh, so his manager, 48 hours within Hendricks firing his manager, he's, he's found dead. But um, Hendricks had said that his manager tried to sabotage him every time he tried to do benef- political benefits, mm-hmm. um, and he wouldn't let him do political benefits. He finally did a benefit, and uh, his manager, Jeffrey, dosed his drink with a super psychedelic, and he couldn't play right, and he ended it early. Um, Jeffrey also had him uh, kidnapped by some mafia, he believes, and then freed him with a larger mafia after several days. Just incredible. And, and the U.S. intelligence had him, according to some documents, under 24-hour surveillance, Jimi Hendrix. So they would, like, befriend the band? The band would think they're just fans, and then they give them the drugs? Is that how they introduce themselves into the lives of these rock stars? Well, with someone like Mike Jeffrey, uh, he was, you know, he, he inserted himself as, as Jimi Hendrix's manager. Someone like uh, with the Rolling Stones, that undercover FBI agent, um, his name was David Schneiderman. They also called him David Jove. He went under different aliases. Um, but he, he just befriended Keith Richards. Um, he had tons of drugs on him all the time. At that party where they framed Mick Jagger, he had a briefcase full of different drugs, including the acid that he gave to Jagger. But the police came and arrested everybody but, you know, Dave Jove. <laughs> and uh, they wouldn't look. He says, he says, I got a roll of film in my suitcase so you can't open it up. And they said, oh, that's fine. <laughs> you know, so they let him go. They didn't look in his, his briefcase with all the drugs in it. Um, so that's, that's the way, you know, it's done. They just, they, they befriend people. They have a lot of money. They have a lot of connections in different ways from different sources, you know, usually intelligence sources, of course, because they're intelligence and that's, they worm their ways into their lives. It it appears. Uh, This is an explosive new book, drugs as weapons against us. The new one from John Potish and you can go to johnpotish.com for more details. So while they're supplying the drugs, the CIA, they're also manipulating the manufacturing of drugs also? Were they kind of creating the drug, uh, the pipeline, so to speak? Yeah. Um, With acid, uh, it came out that the top trafficker of LSD in the world was a man named Ronald Stark. And several very good sources came out with this. An Italian judge, an Italian commission, a governmental commission came out with this report that, that Ronald Stark had been working for the United States Secret Services since 1960. Um, a high-level uh, police detective in Britain uncovered the ring that was working underneath Ronald Stark and said that Ronald Stark was, was trafficking vast amounts of LSD. On diff- he, had, he had laboratories on different continents. And... Um, and he was in jail for a brief period before they let him out. Um, but Ronald Stark was the largest LSD trafficker in the world, and he was part of U.S. intelligence. Um, another man, you know, August, Augustus Owsley Stanley III, you know, just known as Owsley, was working under Ronald Stark at one point with the Brotherhood, Brotherhood of Eternal Love. Now, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love was financed by the Mellon Hitchcocks. And the Mellon Hitchcocks, you might remember Mellon of Mellon Bank, um, and that family also owned Gulf Oil. 
they were some of the wealth. It was you know one of the wealthiest families in the world. Um, so it was a brother and sister team. It wasn't just some renegade one guy from the family, but it was a brother and sister team. Well, uh, William and Peggy Mellon Hitchcock financed the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. Now the Mellons were also very involved in U.S. intelligence, and they financed that group for years. Um, so I mean, we were really decades, and um, that's just some of the many you know pieces of evidence of U.S. intelligence LSD trafficking. I remember when I was a kid growing up and hearing uh, how the Nixon administration was targeting rock musicians, John Lennon in particular at the mm-hmm. time. I guess that all goes along with this. They just, just yeah. they, they really felt that the, the rock culture was a threat. Yeah. Yeah, U.S. intelligence documents just outlined different tag- tactics for targeting political musicians including using drugs and sex to entrap, and a uh, number of tactics that show that all of them were used on Tupac Shakur because, of, because he, was actually, um, he was actually head of a group called the New African Panthers when he was 17 and 18 years old, which was a national group trying to replicate the Black Panthers. So he was already a national black leader before he became a rapper and took on this fake gangster persona, um, you know, as I said, in order to appeal to gangs and politicize them. So um, they had their eye on him very early on. But I show how all of these different tactics that they outline in this government document about using, um, you know, tactics to undermine musicians uh, was used on him. But uh, you can argue, you could show a lot of these tactics were used on each of these musicians. And, and Janis Joplin, they got her hooked on speed? Yeah, a, um, a guy who admitted to one friend that he was working for the FBI uh, became a uh, fiance, became the fiance of Janis Joplin, and got her hooked on speed. He was also dealing in arms uh, with Algeria. He had all kinds of activities that showed he was high level intelligence in some way, shape, or form, besides just FBI. And um, got her hooked on speed, and she finally found out that he had a whole family in another state and, you know, got away from him, but not before she ended up, you know, ragged out on speed. And and then she, of course, uh, developed a heroin problem. Um, she actually rejected acid, though. But the heroin problem, uh, you know, was something she was trying to get rid of too. And uh, she had promised to do some some of the first major uh, anti-war concerts. They were going to be held in uh, Philadelphia, uh, first in New York, and then in Philadelphia, and in stadiums. She announced it on, I think it was the Dick Cavett show. Mm-hmm. And uh, before she held her first concert um, against the war, that was going to rage, rage, I'm sorry, raise huge money for uh, the anti-war movement. Um, she got a hot shot, you know, an overly pure dose that killed her instantly. And um, it's, you know, her sister said, I think, that the CIA did this, um, but it is a known CIA tactic to, to give a hot shot to make a, a murder look like an accidental death. Yeah, wow. It, it, and this is, the, this is really strange. The connection to Nazis in, in the CIA and the cocaine drug lords and genocide. I want to later go back to Kurt Cobain and, and sure. maybe John Lennon and some of the other stories. But let's talk about this part of history. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's mostly contained in the first chapter about how that came to be, that collaboration about the eugenics movement and all. But um, basically, the, the wealthiest families in the United States the Carnegies, the J.P. Morgans, and the Rockefellers started the eugenics movement, which passed laws in, in a majority of the states in the country uh, that were incredibly bigoted against all ethnic populations and caused, called for sterilization and uh, death at birth of inferior genes. It was this ludicrous pseudoscience. And uh, thankfully, it went out of vogue before, you know, with the World War II Nazis. But they also funded the rise of the Nazis, according to Edwin Black, a syndicated Los Angeles Times columnist who wrote award-winning books like IBM and the Holocaust. And uh, his book that focused on eugenics was called War Against the Weak. It's been translated in dozens of different languages. Um, it's incredible documentation of it all. But um, so after World War II, uh, it's come out in the New York Times in the last uh, few months that we saved uh, thousands of, sci- of Nazis, okay? U.S. intelligence saved thousands of Nazis. Um, you know, numbers differ between five and 10,000, however many. But under Operation Paperclip, we saved Nazi scientists and brought them in. And one of the biggest programs we brought them into mm-hmm. was MKUltra, 
Why? Because they were already testing psychedelics on concentration camp survivors. I see, yeah. You know, concentration camp victims. They were testing all kinds of drugs, but particularly psychedelics on concentration camp victims. And um, so people like Professor Alfred McCoy names names like a guy named Plotner who was a Nazi scientist, and there's other Nazi scientist names I have, Strughold and people like that. But they were they were part of Operation MKUltra, and they guided it a lot. Um, so, yeah, so they became assets in the U.S., but thousands of Nazis were also sent down to Latin America to, um, sadly enough, organize things down there. And I show the evidence. Uh, Professor Peter Dale Scott did great documentation on, on the trafficking of cocaine by U.S. intelligence, by the CIA and all, but uh, particularly also with the aid of the Nazi assets down in Latin America, um, including the uh, Nazi asset um, the cloth butcher of Leon Barbie, who helped uh, kill um, Che Guevara, and um, they got, they caused they helped with cocaine coups. I uh, recall in 1980, the Bolivian takeover of the government was called the cocaine coup, and um, that's some of what happened down there. Wow! The uh, book "Drugs as Weapons Against Us" investigative journalist and author John L. Potish is with us. Now, going back to Kurt Cobain, what what was the problem? What were they? Kurt Cobain was going to have something on an album cover that upset them. Why would they target him? Yeah, well, he was considered you know, the John Lennon of his generation. I mean, everyone's heard that before. Sure, but he had the politics of John Lennon. That's one of the issues that they had. They had a problem with him was he was very leftist, and he had a problem with you know he was you know pro-abortion rights, he was pro-gay rights, he was pro, he was anti-hyper-capitalism, uh, you know, he was, um, now the essays he wanted to have inside Nevermind, he, he said in a biography that came out before his death, were anarchistic essays, uh, you know, about uh, about the way you know, politics is, about how, how to revolt, you know, how to make your own bomb and stuff, and so he said this in a biography by Michael Azrad. Uh, I think it was called Come As, As You Are. It came out before his death. And uh, and that album sold 30 million copies. And so to have those kinds of essays, you know, and so he said, well, we better hold off on it until we get more popular when we can have more effect with these kinds of, you know, essays. And so if he ever came out with essays like that in, the, in you know, his albums that were so popular, you know, it would have been concern. But, mm-hmm. but he would be, you know, he'd be 48, 47 or 48 years old today. And uh, he would still be having an effect over the hearts and minds of the populace, and uh, because he was that kind of figure, he was that super popular figure, and um, that's a concern. The CIA wants to control our hearts and minds. Now, was Courtney Love involved in any of this that uh, you can see? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think Tom Grant did a great investigation. I mean, there you had him on your show, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I think he lays out uh, a lot of evidence. And he stumbled upon this. I don't even think he, I'm pretty sure he said he didn't even know who, who uh, Kurt Cobain was before he was hired That's by true. Courtney Love. That's right. Yeah. And uh, did you want to say something else? No, no. It, you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. He, he he just this was just to him uh, a cut and dry murder, and he couldn't yeah. let it go. Right. Right. So, so Courtney Love hired him a few days before uh, Kurt Cobain died, and so he goes and investigates, and he finds all kinds of foul play by Courtney Love in in uh, the death of her, her husband, and he finds he he has you know he tapes most of his talks and inter- and uh, telephone talks and even in person talks, and he talked to uh, Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love's lawyer Rosemary Carroll, who said. He was divorcing her at the time of his death, and um, and you know he was, you know they were hateful towards each other, and they had a prenuptial agreement in their when they first got married, so she was going to get virtually nothing. Now and so he does a great job of showing all the evidence that Cobain was murdered and Courtney Love had something to do with it. You know someone came on uh, different talk shows uh, passing polygraph tests, a guy named Eldon Hoke, who said that. Courtney Love offered me $50,000 to blow her husband's head off and make it look like a suicide. He also said that for the movie uh, Curtain, uh, Courtney, that Nick Broomfield um, had you know, a movie on. Now, um, a few days after he did that, he was filmed saying that for uh, Nick Broomfield, for Curtain Courtney, he died mysteriously. And um, so I argue, and he passed two polygraph tests with the top polygrapher, Edwin, Edward Gelb, and we passed beyond you know, possibility of deception, this guy at Eldon Hoke. 
And so I, you know, that Courtney Love had, had tried to get him to be part of this, you know, murder. So um, I just went into, I investigated Courtney Love, and I talked to her biological father, and I saw the memoir of her mother and biographies on her. And this is a very, you know, it's the part of the book that is um, kind of, you know, people could be skeptical about, and I would understand. But it's unbelievable. Courtney Love's life was unbelievable. She was a teenage prostitute by, 15, by about 16 years old. She was prostituting herself to uh, you know, uh, the Assistant uh, Secretary of Defense, David Packard, according to her biological father, Hank Harrison. Um, in another biography, she said she was prostituting herself to Army generals in Alaska. Um, she was uh, prostituting herself to um, Asian mafia, and she going over to Taiwan, according to one biography by Melissa Rossi. Um, she, it's incredible what she was doing. She was also, at the age of 16, she brought over a thousand hits of acid to Dublin when she stopped off to see her father when he was doing research there, and then took it. Now, her father says she traveled. Some CIA agents met with her in Dublin at his house, and then and traveled with her to Manchester, where she gave it out like candy, acid, to uh, musicians. And she she ended up doing the same thing in Portland and the same thing in Los Angeles. She had all these drugs and you know incredible quantities of drugs. Um, so she was carrying out the same kind of operations as MK Ultra as a teenager. And why was it just coincidence that the CIA agents were traveling with her while she was doing something? So of she it? she was working with them knowingly. Well, it's hard to know what was going on in her mind because she was her mind was so messed up. Now she had written a letter to. Uh, her, her to Hank Harrison, her father, mm-hmm. saying that um, her, her counselors were giving her two and alls and second alls, and they were also having sex with her as a little kid. And her mother even admitted that there was probably some child abuse in one of her child care facilities when she was still a toddler. Now, as a counselor, I work with people with with dissociative identity disorder, right. you know, which is what's multiple personality disorder, which used to be called. And when you when you you know cause child abuse or sex abuse from the age of seven under, you can split you know, people's minds and really mess up their minds. When you also give them the MK Ultra drugs, which are psychohypnotics like two and alls and second alls, you can control them, and you can you can hypnotize them easier. You can control them easier. And I just argue that's possible because other people have given federal testimony to this that MK Ultra had used them as prostitutes and to orchestrate murders by prostituting these same kinds of, with these same kinds of drugs and the same kind of sex abuse and child abuse when they were about you know, five, six, and seven years old. And um, so I show the source of that video of the federal testimony and uh, show her you know, the evidence so that she went through all this as a kid. Her mother actually abandoned her um, and left her. She, was, she ended up in a juvenile detention facility when she got her biological father, Hank Harrison, to come pick her out of there about... 13 or 14 years old, and that's when this all this happened. So it, it can be argued that she was manipulated uh, and just doesn't even realize fully everything she's doing, but this is what she is. She's just a junkie, sadly enough, prostitute who's being manipulated by U.S. intelligence. You know, this is another thing. The, the police supervisor told officers not to investigate Cobain, Cobain's death as a murder. Right. And then... Was it that police detective or supervisor was later murdered? Yeah, what happened was, well, one of the uh, officers that was investigating the death of Kurt Cobain told Wallace and Halperin, the, the authors of two good books right. on Cobain's death, um, Love and Death and Who Killed Kurt Cobain, they said that, this officer said that our supervisor told us not to investigate as anything but a suicide. Everything else would just be for show. And so he he def- so one of these officers that was on that team that was supposed to be investigating the death, a guy named Detective Antonio Terry, um, bucked his supervisor and spent 100 hours investigating it as the source of the heroin and investigating it as a possible murder. And he ended up being the first uh, police officer killed in about seven to eight years um, in the Seattle Police Force. And the person who killed him identified him, knew he was a cop. And knew his, and he was in plain clothes, Detective Terry. So he, he knew he was a cop anyway. He knew his path home, and you know, so it's very suspicious. Yeah, unbelievable. And why would they be interested in Occupy Wall Street? I guess I could see why they're interested. So they're still today, mm-hmm. still today, doing these operations. It appears that way. You know, I just lay out the evidence because uh, someone who did a film about this, they called it MK Occupy. 
uh, you know, suggesting that it's still MKUltra tactics used on an Occupy movement. But Fenton Bressler's book came out in 1980. Of course, I mean, he came out actually. I'm sorry, 1987, because uh, Lenin died in 1980 and was murdered in 1980. And uh, they are, you know, they said that they shredded all those documents and ended MKUltra in 1972 or 73. Um, so, you know, Fenton Bressler showed all his evidence that they were still using these MKUltra tactics up until uh, Lenin's murder in 1980. And so what I show also in one chapter is the fact that some of the same associates of the Brotherhood of Eternal Love uh, that Ronald Stark was a part of were still caught dealing in tens of millions of hits of acid as of 2000, 2001. A guy named William Picard had incredible connections around the world, including the U.S. government, um, when he was caught with that much hit, you know, acid in a, in a missile silo, of all things. He had a laboratory in a, a nuclear missile silo. And um, so there's, there's just this you know, internal struggle between DA agents trying to catch these people and other U.S. intelligence figures that are continuing some of these operations. Unbelievable. Unbelievable piece of work. In finding this information and reporting on this information, mm-hmm. I, I, you're a brave man. I mean, how do you, uh, I mean, I don't know what ramifications can happen from this, but I guess if you get the word out, uh, people will know if anything does happen. Well, your, your thoughts on that? Well, um, it's scary. Yeah. But, you know, I just want to get the word out and, um, uh, and hope that other people run with it, you know, it's all, and, and it saves, I hope it just hope saves people. Cause look, I spent over 25 years working with people with mental health issues and addictions. And, right. And I just, I'm so tired of seeing this, you know, doing it one by one. I want to do help people on a big scale and, and warn them, like, look, you're being duped. You know, enjoy the, the sex and the rock and roll without the drugs, you know. Right. And this drug war in itself is just absurd how that continues right. to this day. And, yeah. yeah, you've been counseling and working with people in mental health issues and addiction for over 25 years. Yeah. But you just couldn't resist this this compelling story and information. Right. Even Elvis Presley? God, talk about that. Yeah, it's interesting with Elvis. People are, are often ask, they're a little surprised about Elvis because of the fact that you got to understand, in the early 1950s, it was a diff- whole different world. And here's this guy, Elvis, coming out and loving black musicians and popularizing black music to the white community that was incredibly segregated. And Elvis went to black concerts all the time. He loved black musicians. He emulated them. But a guy named John Trudell, who was head of the American Indian Movement, um, who went through horror himself for being head of the American Indian Movement, um, he he ended up losing his whole family. His whole house was burned down. It was terribly sad. But um, he ended up leaving his activism when he lost his whole family um, and turned on to music. And Jackson Brown produced his first album, uh, graffiti man and one of his songs was called baby che and it was about elvis presley and he argued that that elvis presley was like the che Guevara for men's emotions in the 1950s he feel like elvis freed us men to express our emotions so deeply and so you know so intensely and um that's what i think u.s intelligence why u.s intelligence started a file on him as early as the mid-1950s and i show some of those uh, fbi documents on him and so uh, when Elvis was still 21 years old, he couldn't handle his success. It was just so huge. He couldn't handle all the booking and all that. So all of a sudden, a guy named Colonel Tom Parker comes into his life, and he was one of the highest-ranking uh, National Reserve members you, can, you could be. Mm-hmm. And the National Reserve has often been used for special operations uh, for assassinations. But here comes this Colonel Tom Parker who proceeds to give him uppers and downers regularly, gets him hooked on that stuff, and then uh, convinces him, and they, they draft Elvis, obviously. Um, plenty of researchers on MKUltra show that uh, MKUltra was very big in Germany. You know, After the World War II, MKUltra was being used for all kinds of experiments in Germany. And um, he gets over to Germany. He gets more hooked on the drugs. He's got a group of people around him that they call the Memphis Mafia, eventually, who are constantly uh, encouraging the drug use, not trying to stop the drug use. And Colonel Tom Parker doesn't let him do another concert for 10 years. He didn't do a live concert after he was drafted. And people like John Lennon were interviewed right after Elvis' death. And Lennon said, you know, you've been pounding me to, for, uh, for, to say something about Elvis. I think Elvis died when he went into the Army. And after that, he was just the living dead. 
And so they proceeded to control the rest of his life, and of course he died of drugs, um, drug-related complications. But um, you know, at the time when he first got big at 21, he was uh, people, you know, young people loved him. They would throw rocks through the windows of a you know radio station, saying, "If you don't play Elvis," because they were censoring him around the country. If you don't play Elvis, we're going to tear this town apart. And so he really was, uh, you know, in, the, in a kind of an emotional revolutionary in that way. And he always maintained that I am not the king of rock and roll. People like Bo Diddley and uh, people like that and B.B. Yeah. King are the kings of rock and roll. And he was so anti-segregation, you know. And so it, for his time, he was really radical for to be so he, anti-segregation. It's so fascinating because he wanted to be a, a narcotics agent. He pretended to be. And that's how he asked President Nixon, right, to give him a... Uh, a special citation where he's now got the authority to bust people or something. He, he yeah, by that point he was so controlled and manipulated and such a shell of himself, you know, according to John Lennon and other people. Yeah. Oh man, this is a compelling book. What a, what a really one of those stories where we're going to have to do a part two, John. Absolutely. A lot, it's John L. Potash, P O T A S H is a second book, brand new drugs as weapons against us. And when you say us in the title, you're talking about the rock culture, the youth culture? Yeah, yeah. People well, left of center? Right. And so the subtitle is The CIA's Murderous Targeting of SDS, Panthers, Hendrix, Lennon, Cobain, Tupac, and Other Activists. But I do mean all of us, really, yeah, because we all get duped. We got duped into, you know, thinking like drugs are the normal way to socialize and have fun. Mm, unbelievable. Thanks John... Yeah, johnpotish.com is the website. Let's continue this. Thank you for being on the Alan Handelman Show, John. You're very welcome, Alan. Thanks again for having me on. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. I argue is because they're using them as role models, just like getting LeBron James to wear Nike to get you know, kids to wear Nikes. You know, that, would turn, that would make acid more popular. Now, when Brian Jones, you know, and they did that with Brian Jones, I argue, mm. but when Brian Jones started sobering up, then they they watched him more closely on what was he was going to do next. Now um, they also got they also framed Mick Jagger right after giving him his first set of acid, so they got him under their legal thumbs, and they did the same with Jones, and they refused Jones a passport and a visa to come out of uh, to come out of Britain to tour in when the 1960 you know Rolling Stones tour in America. So he so Jones had to was disconnected from the Stones at that point. Jones was the founder of the uh, Rolling Stones, the best musician. He was good friends with Jimi Hendrix and John Lennon. He called Jimi Hendrix and John Lennon, asked them if they wanted to form a supergroup at that time, and they said yes, according to Hotchner. And uh, Hotchner um, quotes a member of the Guinness family who was close friends with Brian Jones, who said that at one day uh, uh, Jones sent me to the to town to pick up a friend to bring back to his house. He tries to come back to his house, and all of a sudden there's a party at his house. He didn't know why. There wasn't supposed to be a party. He couldn't get into the driveway. And he goes around the back, and he's looking at the swimming pool, and he sees a group of people drowning a man in the swimming pool, in Brian Jones' swimming pool. And it turns out that was Brian Jones, but somebody pops out of the bushes and says, you know, uh, you better get out of here and not say anything or you'll be next. And he identifies the Guinness family members by name. And um, that guy was scared to death. But that was Brian Jones. He was drowned in his own swimming pool, despite wow. them saying he accidentally drowned in his own swimming pool. Did the other members of the Stones know it was a, something t tied to the CIA? I mean, did they know? Well, yeah, Keith Richards' quote was, he, he says, we couldn't get to the bottom of it. He says, Brian was an excellent swimmer. He's seen him you know, swimming in waves, up breakers up to here, you know. And uh, so it's like the JFK situation. You can't get to the bottom of it. It's all muddled, and we can't, we can't get any information on it. And so they knew something was up. They didn't know exactly what. But uh, then murder contracts came out for Mick Jagger, according to a Hells Angel who testified in court under the Witness Protection Program. He said there was, uh, there, there was murder contracts when the other Hells Angels was trying to kill Jagger. And this was the Oakland Hells Angels, who an ATF agent had testified in court saying that we got we gave um, murder contracts to the Oakland Hells Angels to kill Cesar Chavez and Eldridge Cleaver, you know, the Minister of Information for the Black Panthers nationally. So um, this is some of the stuff that was going on, that when they tried to sober up, when they stopped promoting drugs, or when they got more into activism, because Jones and Jagger were the most, uh, vo uh, you know, voice, voice the most opposition, opposition to the Vietnam War. They had also attended some anti-war rallies. And that was a huge concern, of course, for U.S. intelligence and British intelligence. 
so, and Hendricks, in the last year of his life, had gotten very politically active uh, against the Vietnam War. He had planned to call Bob Dylan to get him active with him. And um, according to you know, uh, Hendricks' uh, fiance Monica Danneman, and uh, his manager, Mike Jeffries, was, as I say, former MI6, but everyone knows that that's the British CIA. Everyone knows that CIA is a lifetime. You know, you don't just leave and you're never part of it again. It's the same with MI6, they say. And uh, so his manager, 48 hours within Hendricks firing his manager, he's, he's found dead. But um, Hendricks had said that his manager tried to sabotage him every time he tried to do benef- political benefits. Mm-hmm. Um, and he wouldn't let him do political benefits. He finally did a benefit, and uh, his manager, Jeffrey, dosed his drink with a super psychedelic, and he couldn't play right, and he ended it early. Um, Jeffrey also had him uh, kidnapped by some mafia, he believes, and then freed him with larger mafia after several days. Just incredible. And, and the U.S. intelligence had him, according to some documents, under 24-hour surveillance, Jimi Hendrix. So they would, like, befriend the band? The band would think they're just fans, and then they give them the drugs? Is that how they introduce themselves into the lives of these rock stars? Well, with someone like Mike Jeffrey, uh, he was, you know, he, he inserted himself as, as Jimi Hendrix's manager. Someone like uh, with the Rolling Stones, that undercover FBI agent, um, his name was David Schneiderman. They also called him David Jove. He went under different aliases. Um, but he, he just befriended Keith Richards. Um, he had tons of drugs on him all the time. At that party where they framed Mick Jagger, he had a briefcase full of different drugs, including the acid that he gave to Jagger. But the police came and arrested everybody but, you know, Dave Jove. <laughs> and uh, they wouldn't look. He says, he says, I got a roll of film in my suitcase so you can't open it up. And they said, oh, that's fine. <laughs> you know, so they let him go. They didn't look in his, his briefcase with all the drugs in it. Um, so that's, that's the way it's, you know, it's done. They just, they, they befriend people. They have a lot of money. They have a lot of connections in different ways from different sources, you know, usually intelligence sources, of course, because they're intelligence and that's, they worm their ways into their lives. It it appears. Uh, This is an explosive new book, drugs as weapons against us. The new one from John Potish and you can go to johnpotish.com for more details. So while they're supplying the drugs... ...politicized them. It was part of his Black Panther Extended Families plan that was working across the country. They were getting the Bloods and Crips in Los Angeles to call peace truces internal into activism. That was spreading throughout California, and then they and other activists, including uh, Tupac and Harry Belafonte and others, were getting those peace truces and internal into activism to happen across the country to the point in New York. The uh, Young Lords, the, the uh, Latino version of the Black Panthers got the Latin kings to, to stop drug dealing and turn on to activism. And so this was, you know, this got to be a major motive for U.S. intelligence to be concerned about Tupac because he was, he was getting so influential. Um, and so uh, that became the first book. But at the same time as I was writing that, I was uh, review, I was reading books on John Lennon, for example, as you mentioned. And I found that this, uh, li- this lawyer, this British lawyer named Fenton Bressler, I wrote in this book, Who Killed John Lennon? And he was also a crime reporter for the London Daily Newspaper. Mm-hmm. And after a seven-year investigation, he found that the CIA assassinated uh, John Lennon when he sobered up and was getting back into activism and, you know, coming out with his next two albums. And so, uh, you know, I just started exploring that more. Then I explored Jimi Hendrix's death and within the last few years, a roadie that worked with Jimi Hendrix said that uh, Jimi Hendrix's manager, who was former MI6, which is British CIA, admitted when he was drunk to having Hendrix killed. And so, and then of course, um, with Kurt Cobain, you might have heard about the recent film that came out, Soaked in Bleach, which shows all the evidence that he was actually murdered and didn't commit suicide. And I uh, ended up researching Kurt Cobain also. So yeah, well, yeah, I, I, wow, so many interesting things. In fact. Um I know about that movie. I, they actually use audio from my shows I did with Tom Grant. I saw uh, that. I heard that in the movie, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, but I got to tell you, it, it's it's just, so try. I, I think if you try to explain to people how the government might have been involved in drugs mm-hmm. in their own way, for example, the CIA's, the CIA's use of drugs to target activists. I remember Frank Zappa telling me in one of my first interviews that the CIA was uh, giving out the LSD to hippies in, in San Francisco or, or I guess mm-hmm. the Bay Area back yeah. in the 60s, at the same time busting them at night. 
And, yeah. and and then 60 Minutes did something on this. Is this kind of what you're talking about? Is it this... is. It is, exactly. Because um, the, the CIA had an operation called MK Ultra that started uh, in the 50s, and it was a huge operation. It had it started as Artichoke and then Bluebird and then came, became MK Ultra, and there was many sub-operations under MK Ultra. And it ran at least until the early 1970s when Richard Helms had all the documents he could possibly find shredded um, but luckily, uh, some of the documents, about 30,000 of, of them, were saved in the finance department, or he didn't realize were in the finance department. So some of those documents, those 30,000, still came out. And um, so that shows some of the evidence of it. And there was many more documents than just 30,000 documents because it was, it was very long-running. But that operation did use, was exploring drugs, to, the use of drugs as weapons. And, um, you know, it's known, it came out in New York Times and other places that they had psychedelic hit lists. They were going to try to dose Castro and Che Guevara and Nasser of Egypt and people like that to undermine their credibility. But there's a number of studies. They, they, they used acid and many other drugs on uh, Edgewood Arsenal soldiers and tested how it affected them, including tests 20 years later. And so Tess, 20 years later, had a core of them saying, I still feel like I have long-lasting negative effects from LSD. Now, the CIA knew this from testing them on just more than the soldiers. They tested them on, on uh, prisoners and, and many other people. Mm -hmm. But um, they could tell, you know, they could tell that it had some negative effects, it, but it, it allowed them to manipulate people that used a lot of LSD. It, it, hurt their, it hurt people that used LSDs you know, in other ways in terms of their uh, competency, according to William S. Burroughs, says he thinks it hurts people's competency. But um, the key is that it, hurt, it undermined the best abilities of these activists like the Students for Democratic Society and, and others that were fighting against the Vietnam War, were trying to stop the Vietnam War. And so by doing that, um, they, could, they could really let, make the anti-war protesters less effective. And, um, and, you know, so by targeting musicians now, now, um, A.E. Hotchner was uh, Ernest Hemingway's longtime editor, and he came out with a book called Blown Away about the Rolling Stones. In that book, he says that in 1965, the assistant deputy uh, director of the CIA, Robert Lashbrook, was in London getting LSD into as many musicians' hands as possible. You know, and he had agents trying to get musicians in London to use LSD. Okay, and so why was he doing that? And why did Hotchner also interview an agent that was part of that, you know, and find, find that out? And as you said, Mick Jagger's first hit of LSD came from an undercover FBI agent that came out in London Daily Newspapers. The reason is... The new book, Drugs as Weapons Against Us, tells the story of how undercover U.S. intelligence agents use drugs to target leftist leaders from SDS to the Black Panthers, Young Lords, and even the Occupy movement. It also tells how they particularly targeted leftist musicians, including John Lennon, Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, Tupac Shakur, to promote drugs, while later murdering them as they started to sober up. And goes into details about how Agent Stost uh, uh, gave LSD to Mick Jagger, got Elvis involved, just in a compelling story. The author is John L. Potish. He's also the author of the FBI War on Tupac Shakur and Black Leaders. Give Thanks us a, so much, Alan. You're very welcome. Talk about how you came upon this and, and how long you've been working on it. And sure. in essence, what I said in the introduction, give a, a little bit of a summary on that. Sure. Yeah, so I, I was working as a drug and alcohol counselor in Baltimore, uh, around 1990 when uh, someone I was counseling said uh, his father was a Black Panther killed by the police. And at the time, I was writing more fiction and was uh, developing a book on the theme of drugs as weapons against us, but from a novel standpoint. And so I started researching the Black Panthers um, based on what he told me, and I found that the leading Panthers in the New York area were the Shakurs, and that then all of a sudden, a year or two later, this Tupac Shakur rises up as this black rapper, uh, icon, superstar. And uh, his parents, his mother, Afeni Shakur, was a uh, one-time leader of the Harlem Black Panthers. And strange uh, police foul play started to come up around his life. So 
I started uh, writing more about him in particular and got away from the, the novel with the theme of Drugs as Weapons Against Us. Uh, ended up turning that into the book, The FBI War on Tupac Shakur and Black Leaders, because his uh, lawyer, his New York trial lawyer, Michael Warren, gave me a long interview saying, I, I think that the uh, police are targeting Tupac like they targeted his Black Panther parents. Mm-hmm. And he gave me all, you know, uh, about a two hour interview of why. And it was very hard to publish an article like that at the time because there was so much kind of uh, smearing of Tupac. And he actually uh, had developed a plan to pretend to be a gangster in order to appeal to gangs 